Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. We continue reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its flavor, how will it become salty again? Then it is no good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on by people. You are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket. No, they put it on a stand and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine in people's presence so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. Amen, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not even the smallest letter or even part of a letter will in any way pass away from the law until everything is fulfilled. So whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and experts in the law, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord. We pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Dear fellow redeemed friends in Christ Jesus, the light of the world and whose light we are called to reflect in this dark world, all or nothing sounds like something that a coach might tell his team before taking the field in a championship game. All or nothing sounds like something that a, a gambler might shout before he pushes, pushes all of his chips into the, the center of the table. All or nothing might be something that a military commander would tell his squad before they embark on a mission. But the question is, does all or nothing sound like something Jesus would say to us? Would he say that when it comes to being Christian, to following him, to being his disciple, that it's all or nothing? Let's rewind a little bit and start with that question that we asked related to our other second lesson from 1 Corinthians. How do we put those two together? What Jesus says here and what Paul said there about knowing nothing but Christ and him crucified. Here Jesus certainly seems to be focusing very heavily on the law. That you can't just pick and choose the parts of the law you want to obey if you want to be Jesus' disciple. You must obey all of it. And if you break even one little part of it, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. He says, don't misunderstand. I didn't show up here on this earth to get rid of the law. Well, he puts it pretty strongly, doesn't he? Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. Amen, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not even the smallest letter or even part of a letter will in any way pass away from the law until everything is fulfilled. The law still stands according to Jesus. We are still bound by the law. It's not going anywhere. Not until the heavens and earth are destroyed. That is still God's will for our lives laid out in his word. Then what is Paul talking about? Right? He says, when I came to you, brothers, the only thing I knew was Jesus Christ and him crucified. That sounds like a totally different religion, doesn't it? As opposed to what Jesus says about obedience to the law, to every letter of it, Paul says, if you just have Jesus and his cross, you have everything and you'll be saved. Which is it? Somebody's got to be wrong, right? These don't sound like they could possibly be part of the same book, like they're part of the same religion, like they could both be Christian preachers and teachers. How do we reconcile these two doctrines, the doctrine of law and the doctrine of the gospel? Let's rewind just a little bit more. This time of year, we're all getting our W-2s and our 1099s and our mortgage tax statements and all those things. We're putting those all together, which means that pretty soon we're going to have to calculate our deductions and our exemptions and our tax credits. And if you do your own taxes, you know 
the tax code is unbelievably complicated. It's hard to figure out for anyone, even if you're smart, even if you're an accountant, it's unbelievably complicated. Many of you may remember about 20 years ago, a billionaire by the name of Steve Forbes came forward and he was running for president. And one of the planks of his campaign was that he was going to establish a flat tax. He was going to get rid of that messy, massive tax code and establish a flat tax where no matter how much you made, you would pay 17% of it in taxes. That sounds great, right? It sounds like this idea that keeps coming up that you could just do your taxes on a postcard. Well, that would be wonderful, except that when experts looked at the 17% flat tax, they said it's not enough. It's not going to be able to fund government. It won't produce enough revenue. So it sounded good, but it, it didn't work. In the same way, a lot of people try to flatten out, simplify God's word and God's law. And people do it in a variety of ways. There are those who simply deny, just cut out, smooth over, pave over, delete the parts of the Bible that they don't think possibly could happen. So you have people cutting out creation in six days and replacing it with evolution. You have... Uh, talk about how the exodus from Egypt and the, the parting of the Red Sea, that's all just mythology, that's all just made up. We don't need to believe that or hear about that. The virgin birth of Jesus, for example. A lot of people to this day, even people who call themselves Christians, struggle to accept that fact and they, and they say, well, it's, that's not really important to being a Christian. We can just get rid of that. President Thomas Jefferson had his own special Bible. You may have heard of it. He, he had his New Testament, and he took a razor to it. He cut out all the parts that seemed miraculous or seemed to prove Jesus' deity or just the parts that didn't sound correct to him. So he took a knife to the New Testament. He ended up, he only had about 84 pages in his New Testament. He didn't see Jesus as a savior. He saw Jesus merely as a, a good teacher, a moral teacher. There are others who say that there are portions of Scripture that maybe were relevant at one time in the past, but they, they need to be updated now in the 21st century. There are those who allege that the reason that the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament forbid homosexuality is because those were all abusive relationships. Those weren't good relationships. But now in the 21st century, where, where two people of the same sex actually love each other, where it's a loving relationship, well... That's a good thing. Doesn't God want us to, to love one another? Why, wouldn't, why would we forbid that? Or, you know, especially in Paul's letters where he says, women should not serve as pastors in the church of Christ. And today, today the argument is made that that's, that's an archaic thing. You know, today we have female soldiers and, and female NFL coaches and female politicians, maybe even a female president one of these days, who knows? How can we forbid them from, from being pastors in the Church of Christ? So leveling out, simplifying, putting a flat tax on the Word of God, getting rid of the stuff that's too difficult, that doesn't sound right. Uh, of course, the, the most popular way that people flatten out the Word of God and the way that I do it, and the way that you do it, is to carve out these little exceptions for ourselves. To say, yeah, I know what the law says, I know what the Ten Commandments say, but just this one time. No one else will ever have to know, no one else will find out, no one else is going to be hurt. Just this one time, the Lord will let it slide, right? Didn't Jesus die for this sin too? We, we justify, we carve out a little exception exemption for ourselves. Think about the third commandment. Is Jesus really going to mind if you miss church just, just one Sunday? Is he going to care about that? Or the fourth commandment. You know, most of our elected leaders seem like a bunch of fools. There's nothing wrong with just mocking and disrespecting them. They don't deserve our respect and our honor. Fifth commandment. Hatred isn't wrong. I mean, at least as long as you don't act on it, right? Murder's wrong. You shouldn't murder. But hatred, you know, a lot of people today see hatred as kind of a virtue. If you're carrying around a chip on your shoulder, you're angry all the time. If that motivates you, hey, that's a good thing. Sixth commandment, it's okay to look 
and lust, as long as you don't touch. Seventh commandment, it's only stealing if they catch you, right? It's, it's only stealing if they catch you not scanning every item at the self-checkout line. We carve out these little exceptions, these, these little exemptions for ourselves, and we, we flatten out God's word. When, when Jesus is going to make it clear at the rest of chapters 5, 6, and 7, there is no dulling the sharp point of the law. He, 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 he makes it a fine point that stabs us, that convicts us. There's no way we can flatten out the law of God and, and shape it in a way, fabricate it in a way that we can keep all of it. And Jesus says that's a big problem, right? He says... Keeping the law 17% of the time is not going to work. In fact, not even keeping 99.9% of the law is going to work for us. He says, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Even that first part where Jesus was talking about how we are salt and light, is that law or gospel? Law. Law. You are salt, be salt. You are light, be light. There's no option here. There's no choice. Jesus is not saying if you want to be my salt in the world, go ahead. If you don't, it's fine if you just hide in your house and and cover up your Christianity. Don't let anyone ever know it. It's fine if you just put a bucket or a basket over top of the light of faith that I have placed into your heart. That's fine. You don't have to live as a Christian. As long as you just come to my house, you know, for one hour once a week, that's okay. The rest of the, the week, if you want to live like, like the rest of the unbelieving world, that's okay. Except that's not what Jesus says. Jesus does not say that. He says, you are light, be light. You are salt, be salt. That's what I have made you. That's what you must be. That's what you must do. Down to every little last part of every letter of the law. And then... I want to bounce back to Paul, right? That doesn't seem like what Paul was saying. Paul said, if you just have Jesus Christ and him crucified, that's all you need. Just Christ and his cross. If you hold on to Jesus, your sins are forgiven and you'll go to heaven. I think I prefer that message, right? If if it's come down to, I have to obey the whole law, or I just have to put my faith in Jesus for salvation, I'm going to choose Paul every time. In fact, that's that's kind of where we always end up, isn't it? You know, no matter what book of the Bible we're looking at, no matter what doctrine we're studying, we always end up with Jesus and his cross, right? That's where we have to end up. But does that mean we're wrong? Are we doing something wrong? Are we just ignoring what Jesus has to say here in Matthew chapter 5? There are some today and in every age, who have become guilty of what is called gospel reductionism. You ever heard of gospel reductionism? It is reducing the entire Bible, all of God's word, down to just the gospel, just one thing, just Christ and his cross. And so it sounds like this. Jesus loves me, this I know, and that's all I ever want to know. It cuts out the law. It cuts out God's demands on our lives even after we have come to faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. See, the problem with gospel reductionism is that it may sound good. It may sound like a nice flat tax. The one thing you need more than anything is Jesus and his cross, and the rest is up to you. Anything else goes. You can live however you want to. Jesus doesn't allow that, does he? He doesn't allow that. He doesn't say that being a Christian As long as you have faith in your heart and confess Christ and Him crucified for your sins, that's all of it. He says the law is part of it too. How you live, how you speak, how you act with one another, that is part of our Christianity too. Or else, Jesus is very blunt. He says, If, like salt that loses its saltiness, you as a Christian stop behaving, stop living like a Christian, you're good for nothing. You're good for nothing in the eyes of God. 
I still don't think that answers our question, though. How do, how do we reconcile these two things? The law seems to be saying something so much different than the gospel. Which one do you want to put your faith in for salvation? They're both here. How do we reconcile these two? Well, I gave you the answer, right? It's all or nothing. Is that enough? Is that satisfactory? No. Okay, here's, here's the answer. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law for us. Okay, put it in other terms. When we preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified, we are preaching the law. In fact, that's why we spend so much time on the very little letters, the parts of the little letters, both in Bible classes and here in worship. We focus on these little minute details that many Christians would say, it's not important whether you believe that or not, like the virgin birth of Jesus. Do you know why that is so important? The virgin birth of Jesus? He had to be both true man and true God, according to Paul, so that he could be born under the law. So when we preach Jesus and his perfect obedience to the law, his perfect love for others, his perfect love for his heavenly Father, that is the law. Jesus is living out the law and he's doing it for you. He is living as your perfect substitute because he knew that no one, none of us, could keep every letter of God's law. He knew that none of us had. And then, I think we sometimes get spoiled. We sometimes think that when we preach the cross, well, that's just good news. Don't forget, that is a, a torture tool. You know, if, if we hung a, an electric chair up here, you wouldn't say, wow, that's, that's really good news. That's a really cool thing. That's a torture tool. That preaches the law clearer than I ever will be able to because on that cross, God's only Son hung and bled and died. That's how serious God is about keeping His law down to the every letter, every last part of every letter. Jesus had to hang on that cross because thousands of years earlier, two people ate, took a bite of a piece of fruit that they weren't supposed to. But that wasn't the only reason. Jesus had to hang on that cross because of the loveless thing you said to your spouse yesterday. Or because of how you lost your patience with your children three days ago. Or because of that awful thought you pondered in your mind about your boss or your coworker on Monday. Or because you have failed to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are all the reasons Jesus had to hang on the cross. Don't forget that. God is serious about keeping His law. Every letter must be kept. Jesus did it. And for all those who fail to keep God's law down to the last letter, Jesus paid the price for it. So do you see how how you can't make sense, you can't reconcile law and gospel unless you see Jesus in the center. He is the fulfillment of the law for us, and that's why the gospel is good news for us. That's why we can see the cross and say, that is a good news, that is a good sermon for me. That is the gospel for me. Because Jesus, by his life and his death, took your place under the harsh demands of God's law and obeyed them perfectly and paid the full price. That is how we put the law and the gospel together. That's how we reconcile these two seemingly irreconcilable doctrines. But Jesus wasn't being a legalist here. He wasn't saying, if you want to get to heaven, you have to obey every one of God's commands perfectly. He knew that's impossible for us. But as he goes on in these chapters and he tells us, he, he refines and, and, and clarifies the law of God for us, you know why he's doing that, right? He is jabbing us with that sharp point of the law so that we understand how badly we need him. Paul was not a gospel reductionist either. When he preached Christ and him crucified, he was preaching the law and the gospel in all of its simplicity and all of its complexity. It's all right there at the cross. 
We need both of these doctrines. We need the law to guide our lives because Jesus has made us salt and light. We need the gospel when we fail to live as salt and light. So do you have the answer then? What is it? Is it law or gospel that gets us to heaven? Well, it seems like if, if you follow the law, you have to keep it all. And if you follow the gospel, you don't have to do any of it, just believe in Jesus Christ, which is true. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. If you focus on Jesus, you will understand the law like you never have before. You will understand how the demands that God has placed on us are more than we could ever hope to keep, even for one minute of our lives. But when you focus on Jesus, you will also understand how much God loves you. That he gave his son to be crucified on a cross to take away your sins so that you could go to heaven. So it is all or nothing. When you have Jesus, you have it all. You have all the obedience you need, all the righteousness you need to stand before God. If you don't have him, you wind up with nothing. It is all or nothing. Amen. Please stand as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.